Great Wednesday. Welcome to the Fully Human Connections podcast. I'm your host, King, and I'm joined by my co-host, Reggie. How are you doing today, Reggie? I'm doing real well, King. Good to see you. And um, it's always a good Wednesday morning when I get to be in conversation with you. It's a great Wednesday. Absolutely. Same here. And since you're, um, your energy seems to be very high, one of the questions that I have failed to ask to initial, I'll say I'm going to start asking everybody that I uh, have conversations with now because I believe it really sets a context. In addition to the gratitude moment that we go through, mm-hmm. what would you say your spiritual energy level is right now? You know, the question being from a number being zero life sucks to 10, being life is awesome. Where would you say you are right in this moment? Yeah, in this moment, I'm up, um, you know, pretty close to a, a 10. If I'm not at a 10, it's been a, a productive morning for me. Things are good. I mean, all of the contributors to my energy and mood. I mean, it's a beautiful day. Um, the weather is great. I had a good breakfast. <laughs> so all of those things. And, and you know, and my I enjoy my work. Um, I'm always a little bit reluctant to say 10. And you and I have spoken about this offline because that almost feels like saying like I'm perfect and I always want to have room for improvement, but it's, it's way up there. So yeah, if I'm not out of 10, I'm, I'm teasing the 10. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing that. And um, you want to go right into your gratitude and I'll pick it up for you. Yeah. So I touched on it already by saying, you know, all of the things that impact my energy, the external things, um, I, you know, I'm just grateful for the you know, right now beautiful day. It's blue sky. It's coolish, becoming warmer um, throughout the day. Uh, but I have, you know, I, I had breakfast this morning and I had a refrigerator with fresh food in it. Um, I was able to use indoor plumbing when I washed my face and for some other activities. And I've been had that my whole life. And a lot of people on the planet don't have access to fresh food or indoor plumbing. So those are my basic you know, gratitudes, um, for the most part, healthy, mentally, physiologically, emotionally, spiritually. Um, and I, I get to do what I care about every day, which is my writing, my teaching, my coaching, my being in conversation. So across the board, um, I have a lot to be grateful for. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you definitely for sharing. I concur with you as well. In addition to that, you know, we say my standard things that I'm grateful for, which is my health, my life, my ability to see, hear, walk, talk, stand, breathe, sound mind, uh, 24 hours to pursue my purpose in life, a mother who's alive, who has sound mind, who just recently had um, cataract surgery, which went successful. Mm. So she's happy about that. And just uh, grateful to kind of experience Again, I've said it before, but each day is different. To see a different side of my mother where she's pretty much dependent upon myself, my brother, um, nieces, nephews, and how they're stepping up and how she's grateful for. And I just remember a couple of years back when she was not dependent uh, upon us. And she used to always babysit a lot of kids in the neighborhood and how she would always praise those kids over her nieces and nephews because she felt that they were just much more grateful to her. And my mother likes to hear, you know, gratitude and, you know, appreciate because she provides a lot of service, but she also likes to receive gratitude. You know, she won't ever ask for it, but if you don't say it, that's going to be problematic. And I used to always try to, you know, say, well, I wish you wouldn't say, talk about your nieces and nephews in that kind of tone, that kind of perspective, because she would always compare Hmm. what they're not doing. So it's just great to see now how much she talks about them with affirmation and, and gratitude, how they're stepping up. And she's so grateful and so pleased and she feels loved. So that to me, that shift. So it just it's funny how things can shift and when you need people, they can come through for you in times like that when you don't think that there are, that they're going to do that. So I'm grateful to experience that these times of my mother's these experiences. And I, again, I'm grateful for the challenges uh, in my life. Uh, the challenges help me grow and, you know, what I learned from it, how I test myself and just grateful for it to be present and be engaged in this particular moment right now. So grateful to be doing the show with you as well. So all those things. 
Yeah, beautiful. I love. I, I appreciate your sharing about your mom too, and that move from you know favoring the neighborhood kids a little bit more over the nieces and nephews, and and moving into you know really honoring the nieces and nephews more now. So that's a great story. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's a great experience to have, and and put in that, in that perspective as well. Yeah. yeah. So with that being said, we can go ahead and move into, uh, you said the tone for our discussion today. Yeah, sure. So so um, as we've been doing for the last year, um, and we keep threatening to find out exactly when it's been a year, we haven't done that. But it's, you know, we're pretty close to that, you know, one year marker. We've been speaking about my book, Healing America's Narratives, the Feminine, the Masculine, and Our Collective National Shadow, with a little tagline at the bottom, Becoming More Fully Human. And what we're going to do today, um, something we've 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 spoken about, the idea of the collective national shadow. Early on in our discussions, we identified the nine elements of shadow. And I'm just going to say them out loud now, and then speak more, in more detail about what we're going to do with them today. But again, shadow being that part of a person, an organization, or in this case, a nation that is denied or repressed. It's like it's not there. And the nine elements of America's collective shadow that we've been discussing and that are outlined in the book um, are ignorance, arrogance, fear, bigotry, violence, greed, excess, bullying, and untrustworthiness. One of the big differences between this conversation early on a year ago when we started doing this was I could never get all nine of them out without having to use my fingers. And I, I can do that now, so I'm, I'm, more, I'm more familiar with them. But one thing that you and I have never done um, is really take a look at the interrelationships among those nine elements. You know, we've looked at examples of them, you know, um, ignorance in terms of race relations or gender misunderstandings, um, the arrogance um, that some groups had toward other groups to violence perpetrated, in this case, by the United States on certain people. But we never really looked at the, you know, what's the relationship between ignorance and arrogance or arrogance and fear or, or, or all of those. And as I listen more to the rhetoric, um, you know, around upcoming elections next year of candidates on uh, both sides or campaigners for candidates on both sides, um, it just strikes me that there are definitely are relationships among these elements. Among, and while people have asked me which one of the elements I think is foundational and it leads to the others, I'm hesitant to say that there is one that leads to the others. Because once, once you're in the midst of it, I mean, violence can lead to... Um, you know, arrogance or fear and arrogance can lead to fear and bigotry. And, but I think the more I look, I think if there is a, a godfather of these nine elements, um, and this is not a definitive final conclusion, but I think it's a working hypothesis that has some, some evidence to back it up. Um, ignorance seems like a starting point for much that unfolds. And just to, I'll just speak to a really brief trajectory of what I mean by that, and then we can go into some detail and play with it. So if I'm ignorant um, and I find myself in a situation where I recognize my ignorance, even if I don't, but I know that people are saying things I don't understand, um, the healthy approach is that ignorance is the ideal place from which to learn. Oh, I don't know something. And again, all ignorance means, um, I know I'm stating the obvious, it doesn't mean stupid, it means I just don't know something. So I'm pretty ignorant around nuclear physics. You know, I'm pretty ignorant around the far reaches of the universe and what the various telescopes are discovering. I mean, I like looking at the photographs, but I couldn't explain any of that stuff. But often when I'm when I don't know something, I know I don't know something. I might try to defend myself and, and feel arrogant, so I'll attack the people who actually do know, um, using my limited knowledge. Um, but I have this fear of being found out. So right there, we're talking about three things already. I'm ignorant, so I don't know something. 
I'm afraid of being found out. There's the fear. I start behaving in an arrogant way to protect myself. Um, and if I stay ignorant and stay arrogant, I can easily grow into bigotry where my truth is the only truth and your story doesn't matter. That's an overview of, of bigotry. And in the worst case scenario, that can lead to violence. So that's just one example of where ignorance can be a foundational element that can lead to arrogance, bigotry, fear, and even violence. You know, okay, not only does your story not count, I'm going to subjugate you or hurt you in some way so that I can feel better about myself in my ignorance. I um, mean, you know, we can take a look into untrustworthiness and greed and excess as well. So I'll just stop there because I haven't fully formulated this yet, but so far, at least between my ears, it seems to be holding up. So I'm curious to, to what you're hearing and, and uh, what you might add to this or critique it in some way. <laughs> All right, well, I think it's an excellent topic. Thank you for you know, selecting it. And just to be for clarity, I just want to make sure I, as you said a lot there, I just want to make sure we got, as we unpack it, I got the right context. So you said that ignorance would be the godfather of all the nine uh, shadow. I'm, I'm saying that it could be. I don't see any other starting point that has as much going for it as ignorance. So I'm not 100% sure about that yet. But if I started with violence, just as an example, um, I'd need to trace back where the violence began. Why, why did the violence happen? Okay. If I start with untrustworthiness, how did the person become untrustworthy? How did the group become untrustworthy? But if I begin with ignorance, just not knowing something, there doesn't need, I don't think there needs to be a, you know, a, an antecedent to that, something that came before it. I can just not know something. So that's why I think it's, a, if, you know, it, it's the best candidate I have so far of being the godfather of all mm -hmm. these other elements. But I'm not certain of that yet. It's, it's a working hypothesis. So, so I'm clear on that. But all the others seem to require an antecedent. Bigotry seems to require an antecedent. Bullying does. Um, but ignorance seems to be able to operate out there without anything else on its own. Because we're all ignorant as infants until we begin to learn. Absolutely. So ignorance seems to be a good starting point. That's my my best guess. I, I agree with you. I think, it, you know, as you were saying that, I was thinking about uh, various chapters of your book, various uh, different, uh, I would say, uh, points you talk about, whether it's the African-American civil rights, slavery, civil rights, to Native Americans, to the Vietnam War, ignorance is always there. It's, it's at the cornerstone of that, right? Uh, whether people admit it or not, whether they consciously admit to the fact that they're ignorant of a person's culture, of a person's morals, of a person's values, and yet now you begin to hate, and now you begin to subjugate, and as you talk about, now you see greed being able to come from it. And I also think about that as it relates to a lot of the encounters, just even in the regular business transactions that I've done with, and, and particularly as it relates to real estate. I tell people real estate is, and I'm sure folks don't always find this in, in every business uh, vertical, but to me, real estate is a business vertical that thrives off ignorance more than anything else. And so much so that it's predicated profitability wise, if you're going to do it in an unconscious manner, which most real estate transactions have done on the person you're doing business with their level of ignorance as it relates to a transaction. Like for example, if you are the investor who are, who's buying a home or buying a property from a homeowner, which is how most people who get started with real estate investing get started by going out and finding some naive homeowner who doesn't know anything about the value of their property and you you've done your research as you've been trained on how to do analysis and and come up with the value of property valuation and you're able to offer the homeowner x amount of dollars that they may seem as to be valued because they've never had that much money offered to them at one given time because they're ignorant 
of what the value of their home is and they, they can exploit it. Or contractors exploiting your ignorance as it relates to making repairs and not knowing what the value of repairs are or the cost of labor or, you know, uh, real estate agents, you know, you can go on and on, mm -hmm. but it's, the real estate industry is just frock with folks who prey on the ignorance of the people they're doing business with. And that's why I think the commission should be removed. The commission structure should be removed from it as a whole of the compensation. But I'm just saying that I can see how ignorance, as you say, is the grandfather, if that's there, people who are unconscious or behave in unconscious practices, behaviors, look to exploit that for their greed. And like you said, they can begin to build on it. So whether you hate someone or not, if I can be, if I can get more from your ignorance than I will. Um, then another case as it relates to, and it was, it was interesting, I was watching um, one of the shows I like to watch. I had to, you know, the way I work, I stay so engaged in my mission and my purpose. The only escape from me is, uh, allow myself to watch one hour TV a day. Mm -hmm. So I have a certain shows that I watched until they into the end. So I won't watch a show until it queues up because Netflix has kind of spoiled me that I like to be able to watch them on my time. So one hour a day or uh, one day a week. So Yellowstone is a show I'm watching, long story short. And Yellowstone had these spin-off series and one of the spin offs is 1923. Mm -hmm. So that's the name of the actual series. And and what it shows is that during that time frame, how after you know the West was so-called conquered, and now they have to deal with creating these um, preparatory schools for the natives that have to go to be in, you know pretty much um, assimilated into American culture. Hmm. Now I've heard of them, but I never knew how brutal they were. And this Washington series shows just how brutal these nuns are who are trying to teach these Native American children these values. And they teach them through you know, brutal methods. Like they're not learning, they're getting hit with boards and brooms, just beaten you know, into accepting this, right? And it's ignorant. And well, my point is the nuns and the, the uh, priests are ignorant to the Native American culture and know that they care to even try to learn it. Like you don't even speak that. If you speak your language, then you're going to get beat. And it's very similar to pretty much how Africans were enslaved in this country the same mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So that's the danger I see in ignorance is that when you don't know of someone's culture, how that can lead to the hate, to the, to the bias. And then that just breeds on how I can begin to take from them more because I'm ignorant of their value that they even bring to society. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great example um, because the ignorance, just to stay with that for a second, the ignorance you know, with the Native American schools, actually it's the Christian schools for the Native American kids. Um, and they were actually taken from their families, you know, because, you know, which is, you know, so first of all, that's nowadays we call that kidnapping. Right. Um, and so, so the ignorance thinking that Christianity was, you know, that, that Christian nuns and priests were not just different from the native families and children, but superior to. So you have the ignorance leads to arrogance. Um, so I'm just, that's, I love the example because it, it kind of traces us almost through every one of the elements of shadow. So the ignorance leads to that arrogance rather than saying, oh, look at this other culture. What can we learn from each other? Which, which actually happened to a great extent in certain areas, not in the area, in the case of these schools, for sure. So the ignorance leads to the arrogance, then the bigotry. Christianity is the one true story. Your story doesn't count. So you're discounted. Uh, um, which led to a combination of bullying and violence, two more elements, because they were definitely violent schools. Um, and, you know, the irony of that is probably the one thing that didn't show up there was untrustworthiness because the, the kids could trust that the nuns were going to remain that way, <laughs> that the, the violence was going to continue. I mean, I'm being a little bit facetious as I say that, but, but I think it's true. But that's well, a good Yeah. The one thing they could count on is it wasn't going to be a good day unless they just towed the line. 
you know, and, and the irony, I, I, I'll, I'll say this. So I went to Catholic schools through um, from third grade through 12th grade uh, where Catholic school was built in my neighborhood. Nothing like that. But it was in the days when certain nuns would still hit kids. So if you misbehaved in school, you could get hit with a yardstick or there was one nun in particular. I'm not comparing what I went through in the late in the early 60s, late late 50s um, in Yonkers, New York. But there was one nun who would actually walk behind you and she called it boxing your ears and she would hit you on both sides of you, which actually can seriously injure somebody, can mm -hmm. puncture the the inner ear or I'm not sure that's the right language. But again, ignorance, you know, that's a way to deal with a kid. Um, and it was still, they were still doing that in the, in the 50s and 60s. So it was, and it wasn't funny when you were a kid back then. I'm laughing now. You know, if we had known any better, we would just hit, hit the nun back and <laughs> see what happened, right? You know, what are the odds she could really fight? But, you know, but you, but because the culture basically said, okay, that's a nun. She's a you know daughter of God. Your parents are sending you to the school. Like we were living in a time where, you know, if if you got in trouble in school and got hit by the nun, you got home and you got another beating. <laughs> you know, um, so got it. Sorry, I apologize for that kind of you know, that little uh, trajectory. I went off off topic there, but but the that's a great example, and the where it gets complicated now or increasingly complicated as I look at the state of the nation in the third decade of the 21st century, um, because there's so much information available to us, you know, the, 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 the task is to find out what's true information, evidence-based, what's intentional disinformation or, you know, misinformation. Um, and, it's hard to tell sometimes when somebody says something that's obviously not true, that's tr that's provably false. I don't mean something where two people disagree on an outcome or a strategy. That That's just normal human behavior. That's healthy, in fact. That's what universities are designed to do, discussion. Um, but when, when somebody says something publicly that's, that's provably false, what's really interesting then is, okay, are they in fact ignorant, which is possible, they just don't know any better, or are they deliberately being arrogant and untrustworthy? In other words, they know what they're saying is false, and are they doing this deliberately? And that's harder to tease apart. So I can hear somebody, if I do my homework, say something that's false, and I can be you know, pretty much 100% sure if I do my research that, okay, that's a false statement, here's the evidence, but I don't, it's harder to tell if they're making the false statement was ignorance based, arrogance based, untrustworthiness based, um, or what their motivation for it was. Um, and that's the real work we have nowadays is to see who's a liar, who just doesn't know any better, who is bullying intentionally, and who is using bullying or untrustworthiness based in greed to get more for themselves and subjugate mm -hmm. others. So it's a real interplay of these nine elements. Um, and sometimes it's pretty clear and often it's really not clear. Um, I mean, you know, the example you and I have been playing with in the last couple of sessions is uh, Ron DeSantis's uh, presidential campaign, you know, down in Florida. And he's basically, he's, he's using Florida as a blueprint for the future of America. And in that, he bans books from schools and libraries. He limits what can be taught in certain history classes. Um, and he refers to um, the woke virus, the liberal woke virus in America, without ever defining what that actually means, at least not on his website. And so the question that comes up for me is, OK, this guy's running for president. He's a governor of a state. He's a graduate of Yale University and Harvard Law. So is he ignorant? Because part, you know, just because you have a degree from a prestigious school doesn't mean you know everything. I don't know what his major was when he was undergraduate, but he had a law degree. That doesn't make you 
an expert in race or spirituality or psychology or anthropology or anything else. So he could be ignorant of certain things. Um, or does he know and he's just arrogant because he wants to, he's appealing to a certain constituency and he wants to win something. Um, so that's the, the real nuance. And that's true. You know, we're using DeSantis as, a, as an example, but he's obviously not the only one. And it's not just on the Republican side. Um, so uh, that, that's the question that we're, we're playing with here. How do these nine elements of shadow, ignorance, arrogance, um, fear, bigotry, violence, greed, excess, bullying, and untrustworthiness, how do they interrelate? And which of them, and often there's more than one, which of them is at play or in play in any given moment in the public sector? When we hear politicians or performance news celebrities talking about issues, um, when they get it wrong and they say things that are provably false, is it ignorance? Is it arrogance? Is it untrustworthiness? Is it greed? Because the performance news celebrities make a lot of money talking into a camera. You and I don't. <laughs> right. Um, so I have, I have no, you know, no reason to push a certain agenda other than I really believe it's true, or at least, you know, at least useful while we're finding out how true it is, you know, at least a valid hypothesis. And politicians and performance news people have financial reasons for for saying certain things because it helps them get a lot, you know, the lobbyists will continue to fund their campaigns and their uh, advertisers will continue to pay their salaries if they're, you know, the, the news performers. So it's it's a real dicey um, landscape that we face. And it, it contains all of these shadow, shadow elements in various degrees uh, virtually every day that I, I listen to the news or read the news. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you look at the other side of the coin and some people will make the argument that ignorance is bliss. You know, that's where the expression comes from, right? Where you can be ignorant of, for example, that how you eat and how that affects your health. And you may be ignorant to that. And you love the fact that you like eating salty, greasy, high cholesterol food, you know, uh, highly processed foods, because, you know, that they've been designed to trigger the endorphins in your brain, in your, your, you know, taste buds. So now then you begin to learn that, okay, a salad is better. And then raw, you know, raw food, particularly as it relates to vegetables, are even better. And then less dressing as possible. You know, you want to get rid of all the, the possible fat cholesterol. And then, okay, now I know better. But now, so now you're judging yourself. And there's anxiety when you eat because you still desire those foods. And now you're battling within your own self. Mm -hmm. uh, carrot or hamburger, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and see, ignorance is bliss yeah. when you just didn't realize the carrot was better for you. It was just an easy choice. Well, the burger tastes better, so I'm gonna eat the burger. Now it's more. I know I should eat this, but I don't want to eat that. So now you add that kind of stress and anxiety to you. So that's why I said ignorance is bliss in that context. And I think a lot of people are blissfully ignorant of other people's culture still to the day in this country yeah. where when the politicians take advantage of that you know and they take advantage of that to the point where they're able to run because most people i believe and you know i know some people may be offended by this but i believe most people who are voting nowadays everything is, is based on identity politics now, very few people are voting you know, based on being critical thinkers and choosing this particular candidate because of this this particular issue or this platform. It's they're saying things that feel good, you know, and if it feels good to you, such as, well, we're gonna end homelessness or we're gonna, you know, raise the minimum wage and we're gonna, you know, uh, create more DEI type of environments and cultures without you know, one of the things I don't necessarily agree with any man, 100%. That's why I tell people you got to be careful of that. But I tend to grab pieces from every man or woman. You know, anybody, human being that has put out some information, I'm not going to just discount them based off, 
labeling. I'm going to listen to what they're saying and critically analyze it. And what I mean by that is there's this uh, uh, famous author and he's an economist and public speaker and he's gotten older now, but he's on a far right end, black gentleman. Most leftists would consider him on the fringes named Thomas Sowell. Hmm. Yeah. And I found an old interview on YouTube where he's being interviewed by Roger Ayers. Okay. Before Roger Ayers got into owning Fox, or not owning Fox, but creating a Fox News Network model. And he asked him a question about crime. And Thomas So, you know, very factual, very pragmatic, you know, person who based everything on data. And he was saying, so how do you solve crime? He said, you don't solve crime. Everything has trade-offs. You just have to accept the trade-off. And I really thought about that answer. And I said, he's absolutely right about that. But the politicians run like they can solve it. Like, for example, if we increase the police budget and add more policemen, that's not solving crime. That's a trade-off. That's going to have consequences with that trade-off. Just as you would say, okay, well, we're going to defund the police program or this type of particular activity, and we won't have that in the budget. And I get what they're saying. They mean defund from the left side. So it's not defund the police, period. It's defunding certain police-related uh, services. So the police won't have that in, the, in, their, in their budget. They won't necessarily do those activities like responding where it should be mental health care professionals responding to certain situations. Well, again, that's going to have a trade-off, right? And when you really begin to look at things from that perspective that nothing really gets solved, it's a trade-off. And you got to ask yourself, and, it, and when, you, when you look at it from that standpoint, I liken it to a game of chess, that you can begin to think five, six, seven moves ahead that, okay, if these trade-offs happen, I can prepare myself for these trade-off situations. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Like nowadays, one of the big things happening a lot of inner cities, and I see it all over the country, but particularly here in Baltimore City, is crime is just really rampant. And so as a result, you know, people say, well, to solve crime, and I hear this constantly from the left and folks who are democratics, they'll say, well, we need more, open up the rec centers again. The rec centers were closed and we need um, better schools and more opportunities. And they think that's the solution. And I've actually been in situations and worked with a lot of folks who brought these resources to these communities and it didn't solve it. And that's where the trade-off comes in when you understand it's not a solution, it's a trade-off. If people began to be more uh, realistic, then with trade-offs, your expectations are not so high. You don't expect to see crime solved. You expect to see if we can reduce crime. Like, for example, if this particular neighborhood has, you know, uh, data-wise has, over the last 90 days, has had, you know, 40% murders go down as a result of bringing in this, this kind of model. Uh, car thefts go down, burglaries go down. And percentage-wise, then you can see the trade-off there. You know, you're not going to get rid of all burglaries, all crime, all drug-related activities. So that's where I think people got to really begin to start to think differently. And that's where I believe, now going back to the ignorance conversations, that's where the politicians play on our ignorance by giving people these feel-good type statements knowing that you're not going to solve crime. You're not going to solve homelessness. You're not going to legislate your way to making sure people feel better about themselves by paying people more money instead of having people improve their skills and competence. You know, whether someone's minimum wage is $5 an hour, I know it's not, you know, I think it's maybe $8 or $9 right now, I'm not sure. But saying, okay, we're going to pay minimum wage of $15. Well, that sounds good. And you might say, well, I like where this person's coming from and I want to elect them on that on that principle. But when you really look at the numbers, what can you really do with a person who's making $15? Can they really go buy their own house? Can they really, you know, get a nicer apartment because they're making $15 an hour? No, it just sounds better on paper because inflation is going to still continue to go. So, if, you know, you pay you $15 an hour, but then gas is $5, goes up to $4 an hour. You know, eggs are still going to be expensive. You know, everything else still goes up. It's never going to balance itself out to the point where this person has a better living because 
you're forcing a, an employer to pay this person fifteen dollars an hour, and they have absolutely no skills at all. It's still going to force you to have to do other things like you know go overseas. So that's the trade-offs. That's where I'm going with the trade-offs. So that's where I'm going. I know I gave I said a lot there, but where I'm going at the end of the day, I think the truest crime of ignorance that's being projected on our people today in today's society, and you mentioned DeSantis, is not just him, but how every politician pretty much praise and run a campaign on the ignorance of the constituents not to have the time to do the proper research when they vote because they're so caught up trying to survive that they're going to just vote on their feelings as opposed to vote on critical analysis. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a, a, a big chunk there. And I agree with you on the trade-offs. I think it's a big deal. Um, before we start, I, I mentioned I was listening to Daniel Smockenberger, um, who's a real systems thinker. And one of the things that he pointed to, which is, um, and he he wasn't speaking about you know a specific issue. He was speaking about what he calls the meta crises that the planet is facing. Everything from climate change to um, the threats from artificial intelligence to um, various types of you know natural disasters, which are related to climate change, but not you know only due to climate change to the prospects of war, both conventional, nuclear, biological, chemical, and, you know, and just seeing all of those things which are happening at the same time. So that's the meta crisis. It's just, a, there's a lot going on and that's not even all of them. And he said, probably the first thing that we humans need to do, said the, probably the biggest problem we have is, is how we solve problems. And this gets into the trade-off because he said, historically, if you look, when we've been able to to solve a problem, and we have, there have been certain things historically that humans have resolved. And he's speaking globally, not just in America. He said almost inevitably, it the the solution created a problem for someone or somewhere else. Um, and he used the example. And there there were many, but he used the example. I think we're getting away from shadow in America, but it's a good example. You know, he used the example of uh, when they were uh, the elephants in a certain part of Africa, and I forget exactly where they were, who were being poached for their stuff, so people could have jewelry and, and different things. Um, and it was this huge national park with um, the solution, and they're being he's building this huge wall to keep the poachers out. But because the market for what was being poached remained what the poachers did was then they made some other species um located somewhere else endangered because they started killing them and taking their body parts from them so that again that's a fairly focused narrow example but in terms of the meta crises we face in terms of just the polarization in this country on, on issues that you and i have been talking about um that idea of recognizing trade-offs and which ones we're willing to make or not is really important because any solution, generally speaking, is going to have an impact either immediately or down the road besides just resolving the issue that it was designed to resolve. Um, and sometimes we don't know that impact. Now, oftentimes we can kind of project it out and extrapolate it, but sometimes we don't know. Oh, that happened. You know, only in hindsight can you see it. So, um, which, which brings me back to the point that I was trying to go to. What, what would make me really happy, um, and there's been a handful of people who have done this. I don't think anybody at the, in the U.S. Congress has done Maybe they have. <clears throat> but for somebody in politics, I know it's probably a death sentence if you really want to get reelected. But for, for somebody in politics, not in space, you know, the world is really in crisis now. Not just this issue or that issue or these issues or those issues. But if you look at the big picture. Uh, I, I hate to interrupt you, Reggie, right in the middle. If you could hold that thought for a second. But it's mm -hmm. like your your voice, it sounds like it's come on the water. And I, I've been kind of waiting for it to kind of see if it was going to balance itself out, but it's not. So I was going to suggest maybe you turn your mic off and turn it back on or something to try to get it back to the clarity ahead prior to the last statements you were making. Yeah, I'll do that right now. Give me a second. That sounds perfect. See. 
what you just said there was perfect. Yeah, so. Can't hear you now. Well, it's on mute. Yeah, turn the mute off. There you go. You can't hear me, can you? Yes, I get it back. Yes, I hear you well. You can. Okay, good, good. No, I just unplugged the mic, turned it back on, and somehow I muted myself too. So, um, so yeah, thank you for pointing that out. I, you know, I feel sorry for our millions of listeners who maybe didn't hear clearly what I was saying. <laughs> I, hope I, didn't, I hope I didn't distract you from your thoughts. You were on a roll, but I, I just didn't want to lose that. So, but I mean, where where I was going with this is this idea of trust. You know, untrustworthiness as the shadow element. Trustworthiness would be a good element to have. And for for somebody in a position of power to say out loud, these crises we face simultaneously are beyond any one person's or any group of people's ability to resolve. And in fact, we are all in over our heads. That's, that's truthful. Because nobody knows, not in China, not in Russia, not in the U.S., nowhere in Europe. No, no one person knows and no one governing body knows how to resolve all the issues that we face. Again, what Schmachtenberger referred to as these meta crises. Um, and nobody will say that because it looks weak. Right. And, you know, who wants to who wants to vote for somebody who says, you know, we really don't know. We, you know we're, we're in over our heads. But every adult human being on the planet, in some way or another, is in over his, her, or their head in some issue. They are. Because the, the world has gotten so fast and so complex that, you know, the best and the brightest can't figure it out. There's too many competing narratives and too many competing issues. Um, but no one's that honest. Um, you know, we're we're all in this together nobody knows so let's put down the polarization and divisiveness and let's really engage in conversations together now i'm waiting for someone to come along and say that <laughs> well they do they definitely better have established a a pretty uh well organic uh influence on social media so that they can't be canceled because nowadays, if you say anything that goes against popular culture, then you're going to get canceled or you're going to get ridiculed. Mm. Because if it goes against, you know, common thought, it goes against someone's agenda. And it's not in people's best agenda. It's not in the people in powers, whether it's left or right, agenda for folks to become more critical thinkers. They want people to continue to feel their way through the political landscape and then escape by saying, I'm going to hire or I'm going to elect a, a hero to save me or to save us or to change things, you know. Uh, even going back, like I said, to Obama, it was, you know, hope, you know, the audacity of hope and everybody, you know, that was the energy he created, the momentum around it, again, the feeling of hope. And now if you ask people nowadays, most people who voted for Obama, how do you feel post? A lot of people, I, I would say he was at 80 percent of people feeling that the, pos the potential was there to now maybe 60. And this again, just my own personal uh, uh, opinion, not some scientific data I had to back this up, but just judging by how most people talk about Obama, I hear not only in my, in my, in my own network, not, you know, left, I'm not, you know, the political right, which I expect them to say what they're going to say. They're disappointed. They expected more out of Obama, right? Mm -hmm. Because and then you know, he gets told, well, he's a president, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But you can't give the megaphone of I'm gonna hope and I'm gonna bring change. And and then when you give me an office, well, I'm just a president, I'm gonna change a little bit, you know, because you know, and that's that's the thing that now so when someone comes with that truth, and you and I are critical thinkers. That's what we want. We want the truth. Just give us the, the truth. Give us the, mm -hmm. as they say, give me the shot without the ice and the, the, the sugary uh, 
additives. I want to taste the real liquor the way it is. I, if I have to frown from it, that's so be it. Yeah. But I, I don't want you to mask it in all the fruit taste and then I consume more of it because I don't, you know, recognize the alcohols in there. You know, give me the, the, the shot. I use the alcohol metaphor just to make the point because that's the stark contrast of yeah. what we're saying. We, we want the truth. We want the, the real, no matter how, much, how unpleasant it may be to our ears, it may not feel good to hear it, but if it's the truth, then that's what we want. And that's where I, again, now go on my soapbox about what I'm, the movement I'm advocating building, where, again, to just look to connect and, and align with folks, I mean, connect with folks who you are aligned with. Yeah. And then you all can set those parameters around how we're going to run our relationship, you know, creating a tribe. And this is our tribe is going to actually govern itself based on truth, based on principles. And it's not going to be open to everybody, you know. So that's, we got to start excluding some folks from that context just because I don't think you let everyone in. And if you let everyone in, it, it dilutes it. Someone's going to come in and try to not be fully, like, for example, the requirement is, I'm just throwing this out just for conversation purposes. You say the member be about the member of our tribes. We are we are readers. We are writers. We are all action oriented people, and the goal is we're going to post a blog a day. That's what we want to do. We want to get content out there, and then you get someone who joins and says, "Okay, I love that," but then decides one day because of circumstances that happen in life that they can't get a blog out that day, you know, and they still want to be members of the tribe where they accepted the agree that the terms are a blog a day. It's not a blog a day if you feel good or a blog a day if everything in your life goes well, then you do a blog a day. And see, that to me is where if you begin to be lenient and you begin to start to allow for that kind of uh, commitment to be broken, then that changes the culture, right? And that's where I say that, that I see now most people are always more tolerant, more understanding than they should be around certain issues. And I'll make my point again quickly on this. I see that living in the city where I live in Baltimore, it's a city in crisis. And it's been a city in crisis, nothing new. Mm -hmm. But I can literally drive up and down the closest streets running parallel to me in either direction. And as I drive up and down the streets for four or five blocks in either direction, I'm going to see a group of young black men from the ages from 16 to maybe 25 just sitting on the corner of different houses, groups of five or six. And that's pretty much constant. It's pretty much normal. People pretty much have accepted that. And they tolerate that. They understand that. And they go, well, they don't have jobs or the rec centers are closed or, you know, you give the history of the marginalization, the oppression, et cetera. And those, all those things are true, but by the same token, you can't allow that to happen because it's a whole generation of people not working. And this is in the middle of the day. And so, and you and I both know human behavior. If, if you don't get up and you don't see, you're not connected to your purpose, just and as a critical thinker, as a person who's growth minded, as a person who's seeking to become fully human, you have to be connected to the energy of your purpose and you have to be productive or your life is not going to feel good. You're not going to, the feeling of fulfillment is not going to be there. You just have multiple days and not hitting, accomplishing things towards your goal. Not just making money, not just being active, but actually making meaningful progress toward your pathway or down to your pathway to become more fully human. So you have the folks who are not even connected to any purpose, how they're feeling. They're not feeling very good about themselves. If you're not feeling very good about yourself, then you don't care about messing someone else's day up. And that's what's going to happen. It's going to create that environment of negativity and hostility and testosterone and toxic male behavior and all the things that, we, that we've got labels for now. At the end of the day, it's because some change needs to happen. And the debate is what that change is going to look like. Is it more police, you know, laudering laws, all those type of things, or should it be more inclusory? Well, here's workforce development programs. Here's more options for you. 
and see, I'm a person who believes that it can't be a little bit of both. I mean, it can't be a little bit of either. It has to be both. It has to be the carry dynasty. There's your programs, they got the corner dog. You know, you don't get the choice. And unfortunately, that's going to violate some people's rules and their rights and all those things. But when you're the city in crisis, some critical things have to happen. And see, that's the extreme I'm on. Most people won't agree with me. And that's the part where I say, I don't speak from a greed standpoint. So I'm not ignorant of the laws. I'm not ignorant of the, of the, of the trade-offs. I'm not speaking from a greed perspective. I don't bring arrogance to the conversation. There's no uh, bigotry that I'm trying to hide it's, or trying to weave through my agenda. It's the fact that I believe there is love and I believe that the trade-off I would have is your rights may be trampled on, but if we got a safe community and now there's more opportunities for you to do things and improve your life and put you in a better position, then you won't look back and say, I wish my rights were not violated. You know, if you can violate my rights and put me in a better pathway in the future, my life has changed as a, as a result of the interaction, then the trade-off is that might have been a better path to go. Yeah, and I, I love what you said there. And, and part of me wants to edit <laughs> um, how you said one thing. So... And, and and this you know and, and by all means push back if I'm if I'm off on this or if I misunderstood, I would love to say rather than saying, you know what would what was happening was somebody's rights were violated, um, maybe it was, uh, and I don't mean like you know let's make believe language and let's do fairy tales either, but provide a different opportunity as opposed to saying your rights are being violated. Okay, here's the way it is now. You guys are on the corner, on the stoop, or whatever it happens to be, that's where you are. And you know you have nothing to do, you have no purpose, et cetera. Here's some things that are available to you. These are opportunities. Here they are, go ahead. And then if somebody refuses them, there are consequences for the refusal. Now, you know, not get thrown in jail or anything because it, I don't know what that would look like, but I mean, just in terms of presenting it, rather than saying, we're going to violate your rights for your own good, we're going to provide you with some opportunities, um, which may or may not violate your rights. I don't know if I'm just playing word games here. Well, I, I get what you're saying, and I definitely understand and appreciate the perspective you come from. But see, I've, I've learned that if there's no ultimatum, mm -hmm. then there's not going to be a change. In other words, if the if the punishment is not more severe than the act, then I'm going to continue to do the act. Now, if you tell me, okay, well, I can get arrested if I'm not on, the, if I'm out here between 12 p.m. to 4 p 5 p.m. in the afternoon, then I'm not going to be out there. If you're saying, well, there's some programs out here for you if you choose to. If you don't choose to, then I'm going to come and maybe give you a dollar fine. And then there's no forcible collection of that fine. You know, it just you know gets to the point where it just uh, it becomes an act of, oh, yeah, I got a ticket. Like, it's like saying you get pulled over if you're speeding and, and the ticket is a dollar. Is that going to stop you from speeding? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, if you get pulled over for speeding and the ticket is, you know, $75, then, yeah, it's going to be a little more mindful. Let me slow myself down during this area right now because I don't – don't want a seventy-five dollar ticket that I got to pay for and, and go through the process. Yeah. When I was teaching in a Catholic school, the dollar ticket would have stopped me from speeding. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, see, you're on the moral path, and see, that's what I'm saying. Some people who are on that growth path and you're looking for feeling human, just the, the immorality of it yeah. will would be punishment enough. Yeah. No, I don't even mean the immorality. I just meant that a dollar was too much. I couldn't afford it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, that, and that, and that's always you know that's 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 always the you know the, the tough one because because the conversation then goes for me and I agree with that that has to be I mean when I was a classroom teacher and a basketball coach here's how we're doing it kids there's not this is you know, my classroom was never democracy and my the basketball you know the gym was never it was not a democracy it was a dictatorship it was benevolent dictatorship and you know 
provided opportunities for growth and development academically and athletically, but it wasn't like, so how do you want to learn today? We didn't do that. You know, <laughs> I, you know, I came in and I did really did. And, you know, for the most part, it, were, it was fine. And I still have some friends now from, you know, kids I taught. Um, but I, it brings me back to the last piece I wanted to say about that was, um, and maybe we'll continue this in another conversation, that parenting and education have to be part of that conversation too, because how do, not that it's always that, but how do certain people end up on the stoop and certain ones don't? And what role did the early childhood experiences have in those 16 to 25 year olds um, being on the stoop? Again, not to say it's always a parent's fault, but some parenting works, some parenting doesn't work. And that, that I think is part of our, our systemic cultural uh, issue as well. I agree. I agree. And just my, look, my last little add on before we get ready to shift into our next uh, section is the most effective, I would say, sustainable change. And I use the analogy of the doctor again. If you are a person who smokes and you know that smoking is bad for you, and you're like, okay, one of these days I need to quit. You're telling yourself that, you know, because now it's, it's inconvenient for you to smoke, right? That's society is maybe inconvenient. You have to go outside and smoke. You have to stand in certain smoking areas, you know, those type of things. So if that didn't get you to stop smoking because it's the inconvenience of it. Then the doctor tells you, listen, if you don't stop smoking, then you can possibly die in six months. Now, that punishment is harsh. That's a harsh reality. But the doctor is telling you that. If again, if you don't make this better behavior for yourself, the extreme is that you might lose your life. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people will, you know, now how how addictive cigarettes may be, they're gonna find a way to stop smoking if they care, if they care about living. Then I gonna say, well, hell, cigarettes are addictive. I I can't stop smoking, right? I think very few people would choose that option. Some people will. I think very few people would. So that's just my last little piece I want to add to that. Yeah, that, that's a great example about ignorance, too, because when my, my father smoked for 70 years and he lived from 1907 through 1996. And when he was a kid, the, you know, science was ignorant about cigarette smoke. And so, they, in fact, doctors would recommend smoking to relax after a stressful day. There were ads, you know, for certain brands with, with a doctor in his white cloak recommending smoking <laughs> cigarettes. So again, that was you know, a collective ignorance. So that's where, where science came in handy. We were able to prove it. Um, but you know, it's you know, he smoked for 70 years and still lived to be 88. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, he'd probably still be alive today at 120 if he hadn't. So let's say. But yeah, that's a you know, good example. How how stiff does the penalty have to be before I'll wake up and stop the um, behavior that they're trying to prevent so sure so now we want to shift into you know because again we always want to make, we, we don't want to get people with the typical doom and gloom here's all the things that's bad with society without giving some positive direction on here's some necessary steps that can they can take a follow to help put themselves in the right path to become more fully human so in that context reggie what do you suggest folks the deal is not elements of the shadow in that context. Yeah, I mean, one move to make, and this is not about fixing anybody else or even fixing yourself, but it's about personal growth. So one move to make is when I find myself having a strong emotional charge because of what somebody else did or said, um, to really ask myself, uh, especially if it feels a little bit disproportionate. Like if it's just, you know, it's one thing to get emotional about something important, that's fine. But it feels like way out of line with what actually happened explore ask you know ask yourself i ask myself um so what don't i really understand about this another way to ask that question which is more frightening to ask is how am i ignorant in this particular moment what is it that i don't know about what's upsetting me and tip what you can find out there and then make a commitment to find out you might find out about a personal bias you have or you might find out about some something that you didn't know about the other person or the event that made you upset. So just get really curious when you have this really strong, usually disproportionate response to something. 
um, how might you be ignorant or maybe even agno- you know, arrogant um, or somewhat bigoted in that moment? And those are uncomfortable explorations. That that's fun to do, but you're not going to change the other person or the event. Not going to. If you, if you can, get in touch with me and I'll pay you to coach me because I don't know how to do that. But you can develop yourself and see from increasingly you know, inclusive, comprehensive, and balanced uh, perspectives. So that's, a, you know, what is it, what's going on right now that, that I had that response and how, what might I be missing? That's the shadow question. What might I be missing here? What am, what's not in my awareness? What am I denying? And see what comes up. It's a courageous and I would argue necessary act in current times. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think that's, that's definitely powerful um, advice. And uh, I just want to share this with you as we begin to wrap this up, that I did find out that um, May 25th of 2022 was our first introduction email to each other. Okay. That's when Ken introduced us to one another. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when the first show started, but that's the email that induced us to one another. So I would say we started right around maybe the end of May. So we are right around, you know, within a, uh, 30 days, 15 days, give or take of being doing this for a year. Yeah. So we definitely see it at an anniversary for sure. Yeah, yeah, good. No, thanks for, thanks for doing that. And that first conversation was you, me, and Kent together. We kind of introduced us to each other. Um, and then we had a few other guests and then you and I just decided to exclude the rest of the world <laughs> and just yeah. come on by ourselves. <laughs> yeah. It took a little bit more research to find out when that date actually happened, when, which is yeah. you and I from that point forward. Yeah. So, but good. Yeah. So we're, we're, we can say a year for sure. We can, we can say that comfortably without becoming untrustworthy to the rest <laughs> of the world. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, as we get to the point now, we shift into the third phase in, in our closing phase of now highlighting a person each of someone who we believe, whether they're past or present, who has exhibited the fully human connection behaviors of walking the path that we're advocating. Um, I'll go first uh, this time and, and share with you who I have in mind. And the person who I have in mind is, and again, I just want to make sure I put this caveat out there. This doesn't mean that this person lived this way their entire lives. So I think everybody has phases in their lives. This again, it's some good. And most people, it's some good that you can extrapolate from, unless they're just totally abhorred. And this, of course, you know, folks like uh, Hitler and so on and so forth are totally abhorred and I'm not looking for anything good for him at all. But I believe that this person I have in mind now is someone I want to talk about. And this, this gentleman who's a writer, he's an actor, and now he's a show creator. And his name is Taylor Sheridan. And he's a creator and a writer behind Yellowstone. And mm. Now he has five other shows that are spinoffs. And the reason I'm choosing him is because the writing that he does for his shows are something that is just really phenomenal in the context that he tries to make them as authentic as possible. Like I said, he he shared the, the Native American experience of going to those Christian schools. He shared in this other show, 1883, some of the heroics behind the African American character who was a lead. Mm-hmm. Where you know, and that's not normally what I see on TV when they depict period pieces. And so that's why I want to say it for him. He's someone who I admire and I definitely would love to meet him because he really takes time to really write truly great pieces. And his success has led to, like I said, five of the spinoffs from Yellowstone that's been created, or I'm sorry, three of the spinoffs and then two other shows that he's created outside of that. And I just think he's just an example of a writer in Hollywood who is bringing some positiveness instead of the typical, what I see on, you know, for most movies that are, and TV shows that I tend to avoid now. So I, I want to tip his half for that. And not, not only that, just really employing local, I mean, great actors as a head, but also bringing um, like authentic Indian actors to play the roles, cowboys to play the roles in Yellowstone. Mm-hmm. So he truly lives in an authenticity role. And I, I want to lift him up and give him the flowers for that. 
Yeah, yeah, thanks. I've, I've, seen, I've seen, I haven't seen 1923 yet, but I saw 1883, and I haven't seen the last ep, the last season of Yellowstone, so I'm familiar with generally you know, what you're referring to. Yeah, the writing is good. Um, um, so, so I'm going to just go into, you know, I'm going to mention the guy that I actually have studied with and read carefully. Uh, I, I got probably mentioned him, mentioned in the book, but Bill Plotkin I met back in the late 1990s. I actually went out to uh, Utah and did a vision quest for 10 days. I mean, the actual quest itself was four days without food, but I spent 30 days over five years studying with Bill. Um, on various things such as you know, the vision quest was a 10 day thing, but studying dream work, shadow work, ceremonial design. And, but more specifically, I just want to honor him. I'm um, in his third, third book, second book uh, called nature and, and the human psyche. Hope I got that right. I should go look nature and the human psyche. He presents that what he calls an uh, echo based soul centric developmental model for human beings. And unlike the developmental models that were based in empirical research uh, for some generations now, everything from Piaget to Kohlberg to Gilligan to people who have studied you know, psychological research and have mapped how humans develop based on people that they interviewed. Uh, Bill is a psychologist by training, but his model is based on a possibility for human beings. Um, gleaned from uh, the, the natural world, basically, and some indigenous cultures. And it's a beautiful model. I mean, the language is beautiful and the detail of it is beautiful. And, um, you know, his, his uh, not-for-profit organization is called the Animus Valley Institute. But his work has been very impactful for me, both personally, probably more personally than professionally, um, but definitely both. And it's a vision for another way of being human um, that the kind of egocentric cultures that we have grown up in uh, about getting more and being famous and making money and finding a good job where his model is basically about finding your soul's purpose, what he calls your unique ecological niche and then finding delivery systems for it. So he doesn't say you shouldn't make money. He doesn't say that. But he says, don't just get a job. Find what you're here for, for the time you have on the planet and go and do that. So it's just a beautiful model. So I want to honor again, Bill Plotkin, um, who has enhanced my life for sure. Excellent. Excellent. And you turn me on to Bill Plotkin. And I've seen a couple of videos of his on YouTube. And so thank you for that. Well, thank you again, Reggie. I think this has been another great show. Uh, again, appreciate you for again finding the writing the book uh, and then choosing the wrong. The, I'm sorry, choosing the great topics from the book to choose as our topic for each day. And this has definitely has been a learning experience for over a year. Uh, you turn me on so much information, and it's helped me grow as an individual and keeps me on that path of becoming a fully human. And I hope other folks will listen to the show whether it's live or watching the re-recording on YouTube or Facebook that you also see value in the discussions that we're having. And I definitely highly encourage everyone to pick up the book and continue the path to it being coming for I'm sorry, becoming more fully human. Get Until our next show. Thank you again. Take care. Thanks, King. <laughs>